Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Conference on Women and Children's Health in the Middle East, hosted by the Center of Middle Eastern Studies and the Middle Eastern uh, Studies Students Association. Thank you all for being here at this very early hour on Saturday morning. Um, before we start, I would personally like to express my gratitude to Professor Donner for all the help, time, and <coughs> support he has been giving to the organization of this conference. Um, he's been very busy with his teaching, research, and administrative duties, and we really appreciate his help. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Thomas McGuire, who's inside, for all his time over the past several months. Uh, we couldn't have organized it without, uh, without his help. And um, I'd also like to take thank my mother, who has helped with the programs and the posters, and um, she's also doing her postdoc research at Stanford in Religious Studies, so um, she's not here, but <laughs> I know she's thinking about it. So, um, And finally, we're grateful for all of our sponsors for making this conference happen. They are Al Husam Holding, the Biological Sciences Collegiate Division, the Center for Gender Studies, Chicago Center for Jewish Studies, the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, the Global Health Initiative, Harris School of Public Policy, and the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund Foundation Fund for the Center for International Studies. Um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, we're delighted to see you all here. Um, first, I would like to invite Professor Fed Donner to make the opening remarks. Uh, he's one of, uh, I will introduce him first. <laughs> uh, he's one of the leading Islamic historians in the United States today. He's the professor of Near Eastern History in the Oriental Institute a, um, and Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. He's also currently the president of the Middle East Studies Association, MESA. His research interests focus on early Islamic history, the intellectual or ideological factors that were at play in the early expansion of Islam, Islamic social history, and the aspects of Islamic law. In addition to his numerous articles, among his current publications are Muhammad and the Believers the or at the Origins of Islam, The Narratives of Islamic Origins, The Beginnings of Islamic Historical Writing, the Early Islamic Conquests, and he has also prepared the translation of the history of Al-Tabari, the 10th volume, The Conquest of Arabia, The Ridha Wars, and he's also the ed editor of Al-Usur Al-Wusta, The Bulletin of Middle East Medievalists. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Donner. <laughs> Do we, are we going to work without a mic, Saturday? Um, Just the upper, is that all right? I'll try to speak up. I don't have a big voice. Uh, well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Sevda, for your kind comments. Um, she said I'm going to make opening remarks. Well, uh, as you know, uh, I don't work in the field of women and children's health. I work on the seventh century mostly, so it's a long way from my brief to, uh, but I do want to certainly welcome you all here. Um, but Sevda was too kind when she recognized me for all that I did for this conference. What I did basically was when Sevda came to me last year and said she had this idea for doing a conference on women and children's health, uh, and I had had her in my survey class uh, the previous semester or quarter, I guess, and uh, she, out of the uh, 90, whatever, 88 or something students in it got the best grade in the class, I'll tell you. She was a really <laughs> fine student. Um, sorry if anybody else in the class is here. <laughs> 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 um, uh, anyway, this sounded like a really <laughs> interesting project, and I went to my uh, trusty associate director, <coughs> Tom McGuire, whom you all know, uh, if not in person, by email, um, who did so much to set this up, and uh, we agreed this sounded like a really wonderful thing to undertake and that the center should, should try and sponsor it. Now, as you mostly probably know, um, since the budget cuts of a couple of years ago, centers like ours lost about half of their funding, so we have almost no money for programs anymore. So our, um, our support is overwhelmingly moral uh, uh, rather than financial, but um, it's also administrative. Tom was a tremendous help in making this happen. And so I sort of sat by having agreed that we should do this. Uh, and watch Tom and Sevda sort of do all kinds of things to make it actually come to fruition. So you really owe Sevda and Tom uh, a big vote of thanks for making it happen. <coughs> and also the uh, Middle East uh, Studies, <coughs> excuse me, the Middle East Studies Students Association, which is basically uh, our uh, uh, <coughs> organized graduate students in our two-year uh, CMES MA program. Um, and I think a few undergraduates may be part of it as well. 
Um, and they actually have some funds uh, that they raise. And so they were very generous in supporting this as well. And uh, Sevde also gave you the, the list of um, other donors which I w uh, she kind of preempted my remarks, actually, because I was planning to list all of them. If I can do it again, why not? That was Sam Holding, the Biological Sciences Collegiate Division, the Center for Gender Studies, the Chicago Center for Jewish Studies, uh, the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, who not only made a nice donation, but allowed us to use this space, which is wonderful. Uh, the Global Health Initiative, the Harris School of Public Policy Studies, and the Norman Wade Harris Memorial Foundation Fund, which is administered by the Center for International Studies. Uh, all of them came through with significant donations, uh, financial donations, to make this happen. Uh, the, the importance of the topic is obvious to everybody, you know, so even to me, uh, you know, in working in something completely remote from it. And I think um, the real proof of that is the fact that there were so many different units of the university that were willing to come forth, or outside the university, that were willing to come forth and uh, sort of provide some funding for it to make it happen. So. Um, this diverse backing uh, speaks well for its relevance and so on. And uh, SEVDA has put together a really outstanding panel of speakers. So uh, we're all looking forward to hearing from all of you. So welcome to Chicago. Uh, we hope the weather holds up. <laughs> and, uh, but even in here, it doesn't matter what the weather is. So enjoy the conference and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Professor Donner, for your very kind words. Um, our first presenter is Professor Marcia Inhorn. Um, she's the William K. Landman Jr. Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs in the Department of Anthropology and the Whitney and Betty McMullen Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. Uh, her research inter interests revolve around science and technology studies, gender and feminist <coughs> theory, including masculi masculinity studies, religion and bioethics, globalization and global health, cultures of biomedicine and ethnomedicine, stigma and human suffering. Over the past 20 years, she has conducted multi-sided research on the social impact of infertility and assisted reproductive technologies, the arts we will hear about, in Egypt, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates, and, um, uh, and Arab America. She's the author of three books on the subject, uh, The New Arab Men, Emergent Masculinities, Technologies in Islam in the Middle East, Infertility and Patriarchy, The Cultural Politics of Gender and Family Life in Egypt, and Quest for Conception, Gender, Infertility, and Egyptian Medical Traditions, a book which has won um, the American Anthropological Association's Eileen Basker Prize and Diana Forsyth Prize for Outstanding Feminist Anthropological Research in the areas of gender health science and technology, as well as biomedicine. Uh, she's also the primary co-editor, um, ed the primary editor and co-editor of six volumes, including Anthropology and Public Health, Bringing Differences in Culture and Society, <laughs> Reconceiving the Second Sex, Men, Masculinity, and Reproduction, Reproductive Disruptions, Gender, Technology, and Biopolitics in the New Millennium, and Infertility Around the Globe, New Thinking on Childlessness, Gender, and Reproductive Technologies. She's also the founding editor of the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, the professional journal of the Association of Middle excuse me, <laughs> of um, repeated Middle East wo uh, Women's Studies, the associate editor of Global Public Health, and the co-editor of the Bergen book series on fertility, sexuality, and reproduction. Her talk's title today is Global Infertility and the Globalization of Arts, Middle Eastern Perspectives. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Inhorn. Can you just get my PowerPoint up? That would be yeah. great. <coughs> Well, hello, everybody. Um, first, I have to say thank you to this amazing undergrad, <laughs> Sevta Felek, who we all thought you she was a graduate <laughs> student here, who had organized this conference, and we were, uh, you know, amazed to find out that she was a very, um, uh, what shall we say, uh, you know, dynamic undergraduate who decided that this would be a great topic, and we thank you for getting all of us here. And I also have to say, it's wonderful, wonderful to be among friends, people who are in the same area. We don't see each other together in the same room all the time, and so it's wonderful to be with great colleagues. And I have to thank um, Dr. McGuire, who helped with the logistics of this, and Dr. Fred Donner, who is our MESA president and is delivering the huge MESA presidential address in about eight days, right? <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> he says it's not yet written, but I'm not sure. Okay, at any rate, we look forward to hearing that. So my topic, as you've heard from Sevda, I've been working for years, really 25 years now, on infertility as a global reproductive health challenge, and I work in the Middle East. I've worked you know, in a variety of Middle Eastern settings, and today I'm going to try to answer these two questions about why is infertility an important global reproductive health problem for women and men, and then the children that are or are, are not produced, and then why are these things called assisted reproductive technologies, the base one being in vitro fertilization or test tube baby making, which I'm going to explain to you, why might they be important even for low resource settings, including low resource settings in the Middle East? And so just to give a basic overview of <laughs> infertility as a problem, something we, you probably don't think about much, but uh, of all, in all populations, of all reproductive aged couples, about 15% of them experience the inability to conceive within the first year of marriage, as it's defined by the World Health Organization. And if you look at ever married women around the world at any given time, about 186 million women, a large population of women, have faced problems in conception. Um, infertility uh, in, in their reproductive lives. In the Muslim world, the total numbers are thought to be approximately 90 million Muslims at any given time face the problem of infertility. And it's particularly poignant, poignant in what's called the infertility belt of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, stretching from the east to west of Africa, where in many populations between a third and 50% of the couples in the society face challenges in their reproduction. Um, the World Health Organization has tried to figure out why Africa is different, and they've concluded that infectious sleep in, uh, infertility produced by infection, subtle reproductive tract infections, some of which are sexually transmitted, many of which are not, are leading to the basically destruction of women's fallopian tubes, and that if these reproductive tract infections were caught early, you could prevent most of these cases of tubal infertility. So this is the main preventable form of infertility worldwide. But my current topic, I would say, <laughs> it's strange to have it as a passion, but it is, is male infertility. The hidden secret, the hidden neglected reproductive health problem is male infertility, which n we re now realize contributes to more than half of the world's cases of infertility. And most of it is <laughs> chronic, incurable, recalcitrant to any kind of treatment. It's probably, most of it is genetically based, um, and you can overcome it. You can't cure it, but you can overcome it with assisted reproductive technologies. Mm -hmm. And so that's why for male infertility, you really need these things. Um, sadly, the Middle East is a region of the world with probably among the highest rates of male infertility in the world. In most IVF clinics, 60 to 90% of all cases involve a so-called male factor. Um, and what are the four main types of male infertility? poor sperm count, poor motility or movement of the sperm, poor morphology, which is misshapen sperm, you know, deformed sperm, and then this very uh, difficult problem of azospermia, where there just really isn't sperm in a man's ejaculate. There are two types, obstructive, because the genital vessels get obstructed often by infection, and the <coughs> kind that's very common in the Middle East is non-obstructive azospermia, which is probably genetic, genetically based, and my, you know, I've shown in my own work, and others are sort of concurring, that a lot of the cases of male infertility um, of genetic origin in the Middle East are probably due to consanguineous marriage, or the marriage of cousins, which over time leads to small genetic mutations in the Y chromosome. So you've got an issue of consanguinity and male infertility. So what are the consequences in terms of gendered suffering? I care about the social suffering of infertility, and fortunately there's something called the demographic and health surveys which are conducted every so often, and the most recent one was conducted with 47 countries around the world showing the marital consequences of infertility. That couples who are infertile have a 14% higher rate of divorce or separation, and that this is true if you look at Latin America, um, overall 21% of unions will end up in separation, they showed in Nicaragua and the DR, 40% of uh, marriages or, or unions of couples with infertility split apart. In parts <laughs> of the world, especially the Muslim world, where polygyny is allowed, and overall polygyny rates across the Middle East have always been low, between 1 and 5%. That's one of the major stereotypes. Polygyny is not a common marital practice across the Middle East, at least. But with infertility, you do see increasing polygyny rates of 15 to 20% in countries like Yemen or Kenya. 
Um, violence, intimate partner violence increases. There's a poignant study from Bangladesh that shows the dramatic increases in intimate partner violence uh, when, when, when women are assumed to be infertile. Um, verbal and emotional abuse, and, and this is a big problem in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where you have a high overall seroprevalence rate of HIV infection, that people who are infertile try often to prove their fertility, sometimes through extramarital sex, which thereby increases the rate, uh, the risk of HIV infection significantly for the infertile. And for women in parts of the world where <laughs> they don't maybe work, they don't have access to resources, um, infertility often leads to abandonment of, of women and they may often turn to prostitution simply because they need to support themselves. So there are severe consequences to this form of of reproductive health problem. And so in our world of infertility, we always say that infertility is really the burden on the shoulders of women. Even though there's so much male infertility, it's misrecognized as a woman's problem. Women are blamed for the reproductive problem even when it's their husbands who are infertile. The, we, we talk about the emotional roller coaster of infertility, the month by month hoping for pregnancy and then the despondency when it doesn't happen. In my work in Egypt, when I started out working with poor, infertile couples, women who couldn't have kids were profoundly stigmatized in their communities. They were often accused of being so envious of other people's children that they would cast the evil eye on children causing poor child health outcomes. They were isolated socially in their communities. Um, people who are infertile often go on these quests for conception, that was the title of my first book, doing anything they can to overcome their infertility, which ends up impoverishing them. And so if you don't end up with children in your old age in a place where they are your social safety net, you, there are lifelong consequences, including poverty in your old age, no one to take care of you when you're old. And in the era of HIV AIDS, um, you know, obviously death is a possibility, so in general, we would say that infertility is a very pernicious form of reproductive disruption. It, it's something that in societies that are pronatalist where you're expected to have children, if it happens to you, it can be devastating. So um, I'm going to just, I want to move forward to this slide. So this thing called in vitro fertilization was developed in 1978 in England. Louise Brown, the world's first test tube baby, is now almost 35 years old. So it's a, you know, a procedure that's been around for a long time. It is the baseline of what we call assisted reproductive technologies. And just to explain how it's done, it's a mechanical kind of procedure. They give women hormones to stimulate their egg production. Then they go into the woman's ovary and they aspirate as many eggs as they can. They take them to the IVF lab, put them in a Petri dish, collect semen and sperm from the partner, let them incubate together for like seven, 24 to 72 hours, and then Embryos are formed in, in, in the lab, and they're transferred back into a woman's uterus with the hope that they will then you know, turn into a pregnancy. So it's, it's actually a mechanical kind of procedure to bypass blocked fallopian tubes and other forms of infertility. Um, and once it was developed in 1978, it had spread rapidly around the globe. Um, you know, in, in response to the difficulties of infertility, and I m must add, this is a separate discussion, but there are many parts of the world where adoption is really not practiced, legal adoption. And in the Muslim world, legal adoption as we know it in the West is not allowed in most Muslim countries. So in the absence of adoption and in the <laughs> challenging environment of being infertile, it's not surprising that people would want to try assisted reproductive technologies. But my argument has been that when these technologies move to places like the Middle East, they don't get transferred into a vacuum. You have to look on the local level at what shapes the use of the technologies and sometimes curtails their use um, in particular settings. And so these technologies, they're not a panacea. They don't often work. They have real ethical implications. And we need to look at the costs and benefits of these ARTs as they move around the globe. And so let's talk about what they are, just so you know, what are the ARTs? Amazing emergence of a host of technologies in the last uh, three decades. You have your baseline in vitro fertilization, or IVF. This is the one for male infertility. It's a variant of IVF called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, de developed in Belgium in the early 1990s, where instead of letting the weak sperm sit with the eggs in the Petri dish, hoping that they'll fertilize, they basically take the few sperm that look good and they forcibly try to fertilize the egg. They inject the sperm directly <laughs> into the egg and amazingly it creates viable fetuses. So it's been a, a revolutionary technology for male infertility. 
Um, we're going to talk more about this, but you don't have to use your own gametes, your own eggs or sperm. You can take donor eggs, donor sperm, donor embryos from other people, and you could use a donor womb, a gestational surrogate to, um, you know, if you couldn't carry a pregnancy yourself, you could have a, a surrogate do it. Cryopreservation is the freezing of gametes and embryos, which is done all over the world in various kinds of banks. <laughs> This is a, a still considered to be experimental in the U.S., but for women, older women who, whose their egg quality is declining, you can take cytoplasm from a younger woman's egg and inject it into the egg of an older woman to, to sort of boost the vitality of an older woman's eggs. You may end up with a child who has three forms of DNA, the mother, the father, and the, the you know, donor. This is a variant, it's being used all over the world with IVF, where before you put that eight-celled embryo back into a woman's uterus, you take one of the cells out and you do a bunch of genetic tests to look for genetic uh, issues and for sexing the embryo. You can tell whether the embryo is male or female. Um, excess embryos in IVF clinics around the world are being used for the purposes of, of stem cell research and actually therapeutic stem cells, and the future, the a scary future is human reproductive cloning, where you could take a cell from a person's body and clone the genetic twin of that person. It wouldn't involve sexual reproduction. It would be like Dolly the sheep, a human clone of the parent. And this is, right now there's a worldwide ethical ban on it, but it is a technology of the future. So what about the Middle East and the emergence of these ARTs in the Middle East? They arrived pretty quickly, 1978, was England, by 1986 they had arrived in three Sunni majority countries of Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. So right here, they were the first three to open clinics in 1986. And now I wanna show you the boom in the clinics. Uh, this, this is a huge industry in the Middle East, one of the most robust IVF industries in the world. Look at the population sizes varying from Lebanon, the UAE, and Israel, which probably have among the highest numbers of IVF clinics per capita in the world to, what's that? By far the highest. By far the highest. People say it's Israel, but I just want to show the catching up of places like Lebanon and the UAE. Mm -hmm. And then these large population countries of Egypt, Iran, and Turkey, between the three of them, they have more than 250 IVF clinics. It's a booming industry in the Middle East, very high-tech industry. And here's a picture of ICSI being done in a high-powered microscope in Beirut, Lebanon. And I, I won't go into this, but we could talk about the fact that Islam is very, what we would call pro-science and technology and medicine. There's a lot of support. When you have a problem, a, a form of human suffering, find a solution for it. So in general, um, the Muslim world is receptive to new medical advancements, including this one. And so where did uh, this discussion about this technology, it started at Al-Azhar University in Egypt, based in Cairo, Egypt, one of the world's you know, most renowned <coughs> centers of Islamic teaching and learning. Um, Al-Azhar was very important in the sort of embracing of these ARTs in the Muslim world. In, on March 23, 1980, which was only two years after the birth of the world's first test tube baby, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar, his name was Gad al-Haq Ali Gad al-Haq, he issued a long and very fulsome fatwa on medically assisted reproduction. Um, and a fatwa is not legally binding, but it's considered to be an authoritative religious edict or proclamation from somebody who's considered to be an expert in fiqh, in you know, religious um, and jurisprudential learning. And that fatwa issued back in 1980 continues to be authoritative. It's amazing. It's held for 32 years now. It's been upheld time and again at Al-Azhar, in Saudi Arabia, in Morocco, in Malaysia, across the Sunni Muslim world. It is uh, considered to be the sort of position on, on uh, ARTs. And I just want to say, we're going to talk about Sunni v, v Shia a little bit, but most of the world's Muslims are Sunni. 90% <laughs> of the world's 1.6 billion Muslims are Sunni. And in Egypt, it is a Sunni, very Sunni dominant society, with about 90% of Egyptians being Sunni, the other 10% or so being Coptic Orthodox Christian. So what is the Sunni sort of permission, or what's allowed in terms of ARTs if you're a Sunni Muslim? This is what the authorities say. It's okay to do artificial insemination with a husband's sperm. This is a sort of pre-IVF procedure that's often tried. It's basically the turkey baster technique where they take sperm from a man and just inject it directly into the uterus of a woman. It's allowed if it's from the husband. 
In vitro fertilization is allowed if you use a husband's and wife's gametes, you know, egg and sperm from a husband and wife. ICSI is allowed for the, in the same sense, you know, husband and wife, you know, the gametes from them. Freezing is allowed. You can freeze embryos, you can freeze sperm, and the newest thing that can be frozen now, it's a new form of freezing, is of the human egg. Oocytes can be frozen. So a woman who froze her eggs when she was younger and then wanted to become pregnant postmenopausally, she could do it um, using her own eggs. And this is a new technology coming down the pike called social egg freezing, which I'm personally very interested in because celebrities are doing it in America and it's going to be the next thing for younger women to freeze their eggs and then use them later on. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is allowed um, as long as you're not sort of moving you know, genes around or trying to create designer babies. This is very interesting. If you have uh, what's called a high order multiple pregnancy, you have an IVF pregnancy with quadruplets or quintuplets, those are very high risk pregnancies. They often are risky for the mother and for the fetuses. And because Islam is generally permissive regarding abortion in the four legal schools of Islam, it, it depends on the timing of insolment, but before insolment, abortion is something that is possible to do in most cases. And so the Sunni position is that if it's a risky pregnancy to the mother or the fetuses, you can selectively abort some of the fetuses. It's called multifetal pregnancy reduction. And embryo research is okay for the purposes of advancing science and medicine. And interestingly, uterine transplantation as a form of organ donation it's been tried in Saudi Arabia and in <laughs> Turkey recently, um, and no, no children have been produced yet in a transplanted uterus, but in the future, this is probably gonna be technically possible. But I would like to say, you know, Sunni Islam has a long list of permissions, there's a long list of prohibitions as well, um, and the major one that I'm gonna emphasize, no third-party donors, no egg donor, sperm donor, embryo donor, or surrogacy, not allowed in by the, the Sunni authorities. Um, the donor or surrogate children are not deemed to be legitimate. They're considered to be illegitimate. They're walad zinna, which is child of an illicit form of mating, if you will. Um, you can't do posthumous assisted reproduction, which does happen in the West where you have embryos frozen and then there's a divorce or a death of one of the partners and you use the embryos for yourself, not allowed. Sperm banks or any kind of banking for the purposes of donation, not allowed. PGD or sorting for non-medical sex selection that you would try to you know, determine if it's a boy or girl embryo, not allowed. And right now, human reproductive cloning is not allowed. There's actually an ethical ban across the Sunni Muslim world, although one Lebanese Shia cleric did say it would be okay. Um, and no designer embryos, no genetic alteration of embryos. Why? why, and I want to emphasize why the ban, there is a Sunni Muslim ban, we should just really say it's a ban from Morocco to Malaysia on third party reproductive assistance. What are the reasons? And there are three really <laughs> important ones. The first is the association with adultery or zinna, which is any form of illicit union, illicit sexuality. The idea that you would take sperm, that you would be a wife in a marriage and take sperm from a stranger is as if you were you know, entering into an illicit kind of relationship. Or if you took eggs from another woman, it's as if you've done something threatening to the marriage. And so people associate it with zinna. Not only the clerics, but people themselves say, I couldn't do that. It would be like my husband sleeping with you know, another woman or me sleeping with another man. This second one is a huge issue now in Western European countries and in the US where we have anonymous sperm and egg donation where we don't know who the donors are. And there are now men in the United States who are known to have fathered more than 150 children through sperm donation. And if their children grew up and fell in love with each other and married, it would be a marriage of half siblings, right? And so Muslim you know, people and authorities say, we want to prevent this half sibling incest. It's haram, it's not acceptable. And it's actually becoming a huge social issue in parts of the world where there has been a lot of anonymous donation. And then finally, there's a sort of moral mandate in Islam that every sh child should know its paternity and maternity. There should be clear lines of kinship, descent, and inheritance in patrilineal societies, and therefore, you are confusing these lines of descent if you use donor gametes. And it's considered to be psychologically damaging to a child as well. So it's sort of a child rights issue. 
Okay, well, having said all that, I now want to turn to what's called the Shia Crescent, the Shia dominant parts of the world. The demographic epicenter of Shia Islam is in Iran, but then there are many Shia majority countries in this region, including Iraq, Bahrain, <coughs> Lebanon, and there are Shia minority populations in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and so forth. And, you know, scholars sometimes call it the Shia Crescent. And it's very interesting what happened. In 1999, the supreme leader, the Grand Ayatollah, the supreme jurisprudent of Iran, he was the hand-picked successor to Ayatollah Khomeini. His name is Ayatollah al Khamenei. He um, took a very radically different stance and issued a fatwa in 1999 saying that donor technologies, both egg, don egg donation and sperm donation, are permissible to overcome the marital and psychological disputes that would arise in an infertile marriage. He used a feminist argument saying we want to protect the infertile marriage by using donor technologies. And so he issued a new fatwa that had a profound effect um, in the new millennium. Um, not all Iranian or Shia clerics agree with Ayatollah Khamenei about this. I would say in general now, most Shia clerics do accept egg donation as a legitimate technology, but Ayatollah Khamenei stands alone in his acceptance of sperm donation. <coughs> there are no other clerics, Shia or Sunni, who say that sperm donation is a good idea, um, and there are many things I could say about that. Sperm donation is not accepted, at, uh, the, the uptake of it is much, much rarer you know, than egg donation. But anyway, so Iran, in Iran, what's happening in Iran, we're calling it the Iranian ART revolution. All manner of egg donation, sperm donation, embryo donation, and surrogacy is happening in Iran, and Iran is also leading the way into a, a Middle Eastern stem cell industry. And so Iran is a fascinating place, and our colleagues, we have just put together a book called Islam and Assisted Reproductive Technologies, Sunni and Shia Perspectives, where we brought together all the scholars who work on this, including Zainab and I'm forgetting who else. But any rate, um, you can read about it in that <laughs> book. And I work in <laughs> Lebanon, which is a Shia dominant country, and immediately, once Iran started doing it, you know, it, it, Lebanon, they were eager, the Shia physicians and patients and Christians we're eager to start these forms of you know, egg donation, especially egg donation in Lebanon. Um, there are, most clinics now have donor eggs, anonymous or designated donors, and they even do practice sperm donation and surrogacy in Lebanon. And this has led to something called reproductive tourism, another new millennial topic that Zainab and I have worked on quite a bit together where people cross international borders to sort of overcome, to get the things that they can't get in their own country, they go someplace else. Massive levels of this in Europe because each country in Europe has its own sort of legal requirements and demands regarding what's allowed and what's not allowed. And so it's been really uh, sort of lots of studies have showed that people are mostly doing this to evade laws. It's a sort of a form of law evasion. Your country won't allow it legally, you go to the next country. And in my own work, I'm thinking of it as reproductive exile. People feel that they're forced out of their countries to get the ARTs they need in other countries. And in the Middle East, those who are crossing borders tend to be Sunni Muslims from neighboring countries in the Arab Gulf and in Egypt and Syria and so forth, coming to the two countries in the entire Muslim world where you can get to donor technologies, Lebanon and Iran, are now, now becoming sites of reproductive tourism, where Sunni Muslims are secretly coming over the borders to Lebanon and Iran to get their donor gametes, especially donor egg, but also donor sperm and surrogacy. And so there's some religious resistance going on, you know, people saying, look it, I know it's not allowed in the religion, but I love my wife, I love my husband, we're going to just make our own decision and hope God will accept and forgive and that sort of thing. So if we look at why this thing's happening, you know, cross-border reproductive care, there are lots of factors, the eight major ones being some countries really don't have IVF clinics yet. This would include parts of the Middle East um, where it's not well developed, places like Yemen and Oman. The cost can be prohibitive. We've got these religious and legal reasons. And then just a list of other things, so, you know, supply problems, safety issues, certain categories of people can't get ARTs in some countries issues of privacy and confidentiality, and this is a huge issue in the Middle East about quality and success. 
Some countries have much more experience in doing these technologies and people know that and they often want to go to countries and places where they feel that they have a better chance of making a test tube baby. So, I, you know, looking back at this, sort of going back to the broad level now um, as we get to the end of this, let's talk a little bit about the global inequalities. This is an uneven playing field. Of the 191 WHO, World Health Organization member states, only 48 of them <laughs> at the time in, in this new millennium, sort of this millennium, not all of them offer ARTs. They don't have IVF clinics. And it's predicted, it's estimated that less than 1% of the projected need for these technologies is actually being fulfilled in some of the largest countries in the world, including China, India, Pakistan, and Indonesia. Sadly, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which has the worst infertility problems, they're the countries with the least likelihood of having an IVF clinic. Most African countries do not have IVF yet. And so I was seeing in my study in the UAE more elite Africans coming up to Dubai to try to get their chance at IVF. So infertility is now being recognized as a form of health disparity and unevenness in reproductive health that not everyone who is infertile has an equal playing field in terms of accessing these ARTs and that assisted reproduction is a form of stratified reproduction where certain people are able to conceive and get their reproductive needs met and a lot of people, especially the poor and disadvantaged, basically don't have a chance to overcome their infertility. And partly, I mean, a huge issue is just the prohibitive costs of these technologies. There's a wonderful book written by the president of Barnard, Deborah Spar, called The Baby Business, saying this is a global business now, these ARTs. In the US, the average cost of making one test tube baby is more than 12,000 US dollars. Because you have to repeat IVF often to make it successful, the average cost of a test tube baby in the United States is more than 60,000 US dollars to make an IVF baby. Um, because it's so expensive in the U.S., less than 15% of those in America who need IVF are able to successfully pursue it. And the price, you know, the global differences in how much these technologies cost is quite, you know, alarming. Iran, you can get a cycle <laughs> for $1,300. You go to Hong Kong or Dubai, yeah. a single cycle of IVF in Dubai is 6,000 U.S. dollars. In the U.S., it's the most expensive place in the world to try to make an IVF baby. And in poor countries, to do one cycle of IVF is more than the per capita you know, income. I mean, most Egyptians don't make that much money. And so what do you do? A few countries are exper exper experimenting in the Middle East with subsidizing, the government trying to partially or completely subsidize IVF for their citizens. And Zainab can talk about this for Turkey. Turkey, Iran, and Egypt are experimenting. I just want to say a little bit about Egypt. There are now five clinics in government hospitals that offer IVF on a subsidized level or partially, at least partially subsidized, including Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar has a huge hospital and it's opened an IVF clinic for the poor, a packed, packed clinic for the poor, um, where you know, people um, basically are getting you know, semi-state subsidized IVF. Why Egypt? Why would a supposedly overpopulated country you know, offer some subsidiz subsidization? Well, you know, we could say that the religion itself, and I'm sorry I didn't, that was a mistake not to capitalize Islam, but it's, you know, child-loving religion, pronatalist in, in outlook, and marriage and parenthood across the Middle East are considered major virtues, you know, something that you want to do in your life. And interestingly, Egypt was home to a huge international reproductive health conference, which is sometimes called the Cairo Conference in 1994, where infertility was put on the global reproductive health agenda as a major issue um, that need, needs to be dealt with. And so Egypt was one of the early entrants into this IVF field and has been extremely, I would say, you know, <coughs> dynamic and pushing forward. There are two presidents of the International OBGYN Association came from Egypt. So, you know, what could we do? Well, to, to deal with this big problem of infertility and these high cost ARTs, first we need to prevent infertility where it is preventable, which means treat the reproductive tract infections early on. But sadly, a lot of infertility is just not preventable, particularly male infertility. And so there is always going to be a need in the world for these assisted reproductive technologies, including in resource poor settings. And so right now, right now, there is a movement, an activist movement of uh, people saying we need to make ARTs available in low resource settings, much like we make ARVs for HIV AIDS available in low resource settings. 
I'm involved in the US version, which is called Friends of Low Cost IVF. And in Europe, there's an organization called The Walking Egg mm -hmm. to try to make ARTs available in resource poor settings. There's a lot that still needs to be done. We need to follow the globalization of these ARTs into this new millennium. And look at all of the new technologies, reprogenetic technologies coming down the pike. PGD for non-medical sex, sex selection for you know, choosing boys over girls is a big worry, including in the Middle East. There will be a day when we'll see uterine transplantation. This is the newest thing that's going on in, in the West now, that women are putting their eggs on ice for the future so that there will be a lot of older women having children with their own gametes. Um, the stem cell industry is you know, t taken off all over the world, including in the Middle East. And this is the big one, that you know, cloning. If we come to the day where not only sheep are cloned, but humans are cloned, that will be an interesting day. And so my final questions to you to think about this, is having a baby a global reproductive right? Should we consider it to be a right, that everybody has the chance as a right to have a child? And then should ARTs like antiretrovirals be available as a right to the global poor? Final thoughts. Thank you very much.